Hey everyone, welcome back to yet another Tech Rules Bits. I know, we already had one like, what, a couple months ago? I get that, and I'll make it up to you later, but right now I kind of have a unique opportunity I really don't want to pass up. To make a long story short, I was going through a list of known prototypes to check the validity of a disc that I have, which may or may not be for a different Tech Rules video, and I found something interesting. It's a preview disc of what seems to be an early version of Space Channel 5 for the Dreamcast. And I thought, hey, that's really cool, I love Space Channel 5, and had no idea this was a thing. And neither does the rest of the internet, apparently, because I couldn't find any documentation on it whatsoever. In fact, it's recently come to my attention that this concept is strange to a lot of people, that a prototype is just floating out in the wild without anyone talking about it or taking a closer look at it. It's a pretty normal occurrence. See, the thing is, you have to understand, there are countless amounts of prototypes just hanging out on the corners of the internet. Like, like, they were uploaded one day in a mass disc rip among a bunch of other prototypes, undocumented and, I guess, forgotten. Chances are the ones that you have heard about were probably because they were of a popular game, or they were created early enough in development that there were massive gameplay changes. However, for documentation of these less glamorous and exciting prototypes to come to light, it kind of requires the effort of someone who likes the game enough to actually dig into these things. And you know what? That person could be you. Which, I suppose, brings me to the point of this video. I want to show that all it takes to do this kind of stuff to a decent extent is a passion for a game and some basic googling skills. I can already tell this is going to be one of my stranger videos, and while I do hope it's at least interesting to watch for most people, the message it was designed to project may only be received by like three people. But you know what? If those three people go on to find a love for hacking and data mining like I did when I did this kind of stuff years and years ago, then I'll be happy. I, I think I'm derailing a bit though. The point is we're going to be looking at the Space Channel 5 prototype and see what differences we can find compared to the final version. So without further theatrics, I guess we'll get right into it. But first, a big thanks to Keeps for sponsoring this video. Last video, we talked about how Baldi's negativity might be related to his lack of hair. Today, I want to focus on the positive side of things. Namely, look how happy everyone is in this game. The difference? You guessed it, hair. <laughs> yes, I will run this joke into the ground, and no, it's not negotiable. And unfortunately, two out of three guys will experience male pattern baldness by the time they're 35. Once that hair's gone, there's no getting it back. That's where Keeps comes in. They offer effective and affordable ways for men to keep your hair and even set them up with online doctor's visits for a prescription of the only two hair loss products currently approved by the FDA. With more 5-star reviews than any of their competition and nearly 100,000 users, the choice should be obvious. After all, what do you have to lose? Oh. A, a lot, I guess. That's what Keeps is trying to prevent. But that's all the more reason to head on down to Keeps.com slash tech rules or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. Anyway, back to the video. The first thing we should probably do before anything else is uh, admittedly pretty obvious. Let's just play the game. This is especially true if it's a game that you're not very familiar with, so you can kind of get a feel for the game and gain some context for the files you're about to be going through. Or, in my case, it may just be a game you've played a thousand times, in which case you'll be very attentive when it comes to things that are different. It's just, you know, it's a good thing to do no matter what. For those of you that haven't played this game a thousand times, which, I don't know, is probably all of you, <laughs> I'll just give you the brief rundown of the experience. Space Channel 5 is a simple and fun little rhythm game that plays like Simon Says essentially. Your opponent gives you certain callouts like up, down, left, right, stuff like that, and you have to repeat those callouts back to the opponent in time with the music to fight back. What you're looking at now is the playthrough I finished capturing just a few minutes ago, and I'll summarize the interesting points I found. As far as gameplay goes, the game felt pretty much the same with a few things worth noting. Well, first of all, the moment I booted up the game, the first thing I wanted to do was to get to stage 4 and see if Space Michael was there. Because I know that, yeah, he's probably there, but what if, you know? Uh, for clarification, Space Michael is Michael Jackson. Not like a Michael Jackson reference, but a direct cameo voiced by Michael himself. And supposedly, he was added extremely late into development. To be honest, I wasn't going to be able to focus on the smaller details until I confirmed whether or not he was there, so I played all the way up there, and sure enough, Space Michael's there. Not surprising, but oh well. I'm looking into it now, and that was a really dumb thing to think anyway. The game came out in 1999 in Japan, and this disc has the timestamp of April 20th, 2000. That's like just a couple months before the US release of the game, so what we're looking at is probably just an earlier revision of the game's localization. Therefore, all the changes we'll find will probably just be voice lines and other translation stuff. That's essentially the first rule of looking through prototypes. Yes, we're, we're doing rules now. I've decided just now this is what we're doing. Rule number one, 
don't go in expecting to find something substantially different or game-changing. That doesn't mean you won't find something like that, but these kind of prototypes really only start being moved around outside of the development team when things are kind of like wrapping up, if that makes any sense. That being said, I did pick up on something really neat that affects this game pretty significantly, and that's the callouts of the main character Ulala. Essentially, something felt really off when I was playing, and I could not, for the life of me, figure out what it was until halfway through stage one. As it turns out, Ulala's callouts are different from the final version. Here's how it's supposed to sound. Up, right, left, down, shoot, shoot, shoot. And here's how it sounds in the prototype. Up, right, left, down, shoot, shoot, shoot. I, I don't know, I thought it was neat. It was giving me this really weird sense of deja vu though, like I've heard these exact voice lines somewhere before. I never quite figured it out before I finished the game anyway. The rest of the things I noticed weren't too weird. I think the thing that stood out the most was for some reason the Morolians at the end of the game were missing some voice lines. Which for that matter doesn't make any sense considering those lines aren't even changed for the English version, but whatever, I guess mistakes happen. And that's really all I was able to tell from just doing a normal playthrough. Doesn't seem like much, right? Don't worry, it usually doesn't seem like much at first glance, and that's just because it's really easy to overlook stuff like that when you don't know where to look. Thankfully, here's where we get to the fun part. Here we have two- you're caught up by the way, I'm commentating in real time now. We have two copies of the game here. One of them's the prototype, and the other's a personally verified copy of the US release. So what we're gonna do now is open these files in GD-ROM Explorer, which is really just a convenient tool for checking out Dreamcast images, and we're gonna extract all the files for both games. Oh, while this is doing that, I figured out where I heard those voice lines. They're from the English version of Ulala's Cosmic Attack, a port of Space Channel 5 to the Game Boy Advance of all things. I remember playing this game now actually, and at the time I think I thought they just used those lines because they were shorter and took up less space on the cart, but it seems like this was such a last minute change they may not have even noticed that those were the wrong lines to use. It's just speculation I guess, I don't know, it's, it's hard to know without talking to someone who worked on the game. It's not important anyway, now that the files are extracted, you can see that we have uh, quite a few files to go through. However, remember that we only really need to examine the files that are different when compared to the final version. So to do that, we're literally just gonna use a simple file comparison tool. I'm using WinMerge because it's already on my PC, but it, it I promise it could not matter less. And here's what we have. Now, admittedly, you're gonna have to use a little ingenuity for this part. A lot of times you're gonna run into files with extensions you've never seen before, or one that doesn't give you much of a hint on what it's used for. These round.bin files are a good example here. But more often than not, the file extensions themselves are not necessarily necessarily exclusive to the games themselves. Right off the bat, I recognize most of these files simply because they're commonly used with games on the Dreamcast, especially first-party Sega titles. FirstRead.bin is essentially the main executable, and that's obviously going to be different because it's a different build of the game. But there could also be something else interesting in there, we'll have to find out. The PVM format is for textures, so judging from the name title.pvm, there's probably an early menu graphic in there that I overlooked when I was playing. VoiceData.afs is where the voice lines are going to be stored. AFS files contain a special kind of sound format called ADX. They're not compressed or anything, they're just typically packed in like that for some reason. But that's great, because we can extract those ADX files later and play them with VLC to see what's different. We already know that the callouts are different at the very least, but there could very well be other interesting things to find. My memory is a little hazy on this one, but I think SFD files are just for FMV cutscenes. OP probably means opening, but I can't say I really saw anything different in the opening. I'll take another look though. Now here are the parts that might be a little tricky. These round dot bin files, they could be a lot of things. I checked them out real quick in a hex editor to see if I could find maybe a header or some sort of string that might give me a hint as to what they're used for, and I can't make heads or tails of it. It looks completely proprietary, but I can probably safely assume that it has something to do with stage data. As far as the MLT files, I know what these are, but it doesn't make any sense that these would be different. Basically, they're instructions for the Dreamcast that tells it how to play sounds and music. They're like MIDIs, essentially. But it was my understanding that Space Channel 5 only used use streamed music and sound effects. Most of the music is played by a live band even. It's possible that I just overlook these instances, but even still, why would these be different in the first place? If this is really a localization prototype, right? The game should have been completed at this point, so what would be in there that would need tampering at all? Well, either way, 
We have a lot of leads to follow. I guess we'll just start with what looks interesting and go from there. Let's start with the tinyl.pvm because I don't have a clue what could be different here. These kind of files are so easy to unpack. These were very frequently used with the Dreamcast, so there's lots of tools made specifically to unpack it. Normally I'd look through these manually just for fun, but for the sake of the video, I'll extract all the textures and use the same file comparison tool to see which ones are different. Oh, I think I know what these files are. These are icons used in the character profile menu. I don't think I mentioned that part of the game has to do with rescue rescuing hostages and saving them unlocks their profile in this menu. But when you haven't rescued them yet, they're locked and I think they use these graphics. So it's literally just that these two graphics weren't translated yet. That's all that's in here. These were the only textures that were different. So that's neat. Next I'll probably open up round1.bin. Well, both versions of them actually. I'm gonna load the prototype one and the final one in a hex editor and compare them bite by bite. I may have a better chance of figuring out what this is if I can see what's supposed to be different about it. No, sorry, this isn't helping. It just kind of seems like random bytes are different here and there with no discernible rhyme or reason. I'm not saying there aren't practical differences in this file, but I'm inclined to believe it's just some weirdness with the tool they were using. I don't really want to put in the work to figure it out anyway. You know, speaking of putting in the work, I don't actually know how to open these MLT files. Like, I'm very familiar with the DSF files that these things include, but I don't actually know how to easily get to them. Uh... Here, let me see what tools are available online. Okay, boom. I found a Python script by someone named Kingshriek called DSFmake. It looks like exactly what I needed, so I really lucked out here. Rule number two. Google everything. Although I guess that's more of a rule of life than anything. I'll just run the script and we'll have the files. Okay, so from the creation date, it's probably Python 2. And this is the file. Uh, hello? <laughs> hey, uh, you wanna, you wanna talk to me? It, it's not doing anything. I'm checking the output. It's not doing anything. If I'm not using the right syntax, it's certainly not telling me the right way to do it. I'm just kind of getting the silent treatment here. Yeah, okay. Guess I'll have to open up the script and see if I can figure out what's wrong myself. I am not nearly smart enough to be doing stuff like this. Uh, case in point, I can't actually find where the input is established. Wait, do you... Do you want me to put the name of the file in the script? Like, like directly in the script. Is that what you want me to do? Like, like this? What? I, okay, okay. Is that like, what? I can't say I've ever been asked to do that before. There wasn't even a readme or anything that would have told me how to use that either. I was just supposed to open it and see that field. But hey, it works. Okay, so it looks like all of these are mini DSF files, which is just fine. I can play these in foobar thanks to, uh, I don't know actually, one of the thousand plugins I have in here, it might be VGM stream. It doesn't really matter, I just want to hear one of these so I know where these files are used. Okay then, something tells me that's not how it's supposed to sound. I think it's just having a weird issue with the sound font. Let me try a little bit of manual modification and see if I can't get it to sound correct. Oh, I know, okay, I know where these are used. This is for the little back and forth segments during the gameplay sections. Wow, those are DSFs? Huh, they blend in well enough with the actual streamed music that I didn't even notice. Oh, right, the differences. Sorry, got distracted. Uh, so I unpacked both versions of every single MLT file and I can't find any differences whatsoever. It looks like I just went through all that for nothing, actually. They were probably just packed differently and it led to small byte differences. So, uh, dead end, I guess. Let's just move on. Okay, not much left now. OP.SFD is in another format that's extremely common with Dreamcast, so let's just convert that and see if we can't spot the difference. Uh, I'm on my second pass through and I'm not really noticing anything different. Okay, okay, there it is. I should have guessed. The little earthlings here are speaking Japanese in the prototype. <laughs> In the final version, it's translated into vague cries of help that <laughs> they certainly sound like English, but I have no earthly idea what they're saying. That leaves us with only two files. If I leave the voice data for last and it turns out that the only differences were the callouts we already heard, that would be really anticlimactic. So we'll take a look at this next. For this one, there's actually an extremely convenient tool made for Shinmu that I like using for these kind of files. Don't get me wrong, there are a thousand tools made to unpack AFS archives, but man, the tools for Shinmu are so nice. I try to use them every chance I get. They're part of something called the Shinmu Translation Pack by the Shintrad team. They're essentially just hacking tools designed to streamline fan translations of Shinmu. You know what? 
Rule number three, check if tools from other games can help. That sounds like I'm just making that up on the spot, but it really does help. I remember a long time ago, I was data mining a really obscure PS2 game that I also adore called Guitaru Man. And of course, there were no tools for it. But the format for the models were also used in a different game Koei published, Dynasty Warriors. And while there wasn't documentation on Guitar Man, there was for the Dynasty Warriors game that shared the model format with it, so that helped a bunch. Wait, what was my point? Developers, yes, check check other games by the same developers or publishers or even the same console. Rule number three. Four, actually. I, I don't know. I lost count. Rule three and a half. So of the countless amounts of audio files we had in this archive, only these are different. I went ahead and looked at them real quick. The last one here is one I noticed earlier. They forgot to include the Merolian voices at the end for some reason. These two, on the other hand, are just timed differently. Overall, it's interesting to note, but not particularly fascinating. So in other words, I'm glad I didn't save it for last. And finally, we have firstread.bin. This might take a while to go through depending on how different the file is. This file can have almost any amount of game data in it, so there's a pretty good chance we'll find something worth value in here. Unfortunately, we don't have any fancy tools this time. We'll just have to go in with a hex editor slowly but surely. No, here's a bunch of small differences, but I, I think it's just a compiling thing. Oh, okay, here we go. We just hit a gold mine. The character profiles are in here, and it looks like there are several differences compared to the final version. Some of them are typos, uh, some of them might be jokes that they decided weren't appropriate for the game's age rating. Uh, there a little ugly to read straight from the file, so I'll just mark which ones are different, and I can show them side by side in game once we get to the end of the file. Yeah, okay, gonna be honest, I haven't really found anything else, and at this point I've pretty much spent my entire workday going through this game, so I'm just about ready to wrap this up. As promised though, I did mark all the profile changes, and we'll go over those now. A few of these are just your standard typos. For example, Arthur Scholes wants you to know that he is Alving husband, <laughs> and has fathered two loving daughters. <laughs> these were <clears throat> these were fixed the way you'd expect. But there's actually something really weird here. Lex Banana's pro I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Lex Banana Esquire's profile says he's a Galaxy Lines pilot, but the final version has him working as a Galaxy Lines pilot. Is like Galaxy supposed to be the name of the airline, or is this just a weird change that got reverted? Oh, the rest of them are straight up revisions though. Chloe Kachuka used to write nasty things about her friends. Apparently there was a problem with this wording because they reworded it to write secret things about her friends. Melody McBean, on the other hand, this one's interesting. It says here that her husband, a former game producer, is under close observation at the mental ward. Out of sheer surprise and curiosity, I loaded up the Japanese version of the game to see the original text, and it literally just mentions that her husband isn't home very often. So this whole mental ward detail was added in by someone from the localization team. Now, I don't want to jump to the obvious conclusion that someone working on Space Channel 5 was really fed up with his job, but no, no, that's a lie. I absolutely want to do that. I, I want this so badly to be true. Please send me an email with your stories, Mr. Mentally Damaged Game Producer. Anyway, now it just says that her husband is a former game producer. His pain was retconned, I guess. Good for him. And finally, there's Euclid Ephrodites. His parents think he's studying, but really he just picks his toes. Okay, yeah, that one's kind of weird. I get why you'd change that one. But what they decided to change it to is, uh, interesting. His parents think he's studying, but really, he's plotting their demise. Are we are we still talking about Euclid's parents, Mr. Angry Game Producer? You sure you don't need a talk or anything? Anyway, that's it. We've essentially covered every single difference I could find. A lot of that may have looked a bit technical near the end, but you pick up on it really quickly, I assure you. Now, obviously, I probably did miss some things, but the most signi- Hold up. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Ulala's callouts. Would it- those callouts were different. Why didn't I find those? Did I overlook them? I don't... Where are they? Okay, I'm honestly a little baffled, but whatever. I have a plan. I actually have a tool here called AD Extract, which pulls ADX files straight from uncompressed archives. I'm gonna use it on the entire game. If there's an ADX file to be found in here and I overlooked it, this program will find it. What do you mean? These are the ones that I found earlier. It, it, nope, it's not in here. Okay, um, there's a few potential reasons why I can't find these voice lines. One they're not ADX files at all, which would be really weird considering literally every other sound file in the game is ADX. The voice lines, the music, all of it is ADX. If that's the case, not only would I have no idea where to look for it, but to be honest, I'm not even 100% certain what I'm looking for. Two, the files are in some sort of encrypted archive in one of the proprietary files I don't know how to get into, in which case... Uh oh. Or three, both the early and final callouts are on both discs and the game is just calling one set of them and ignoring the others. And that makes no sense. I'm gonna be honest with you, I hate all of these possibilities. Any of these being true would mean I'd have to go on what's essentially a treasure hunt to find these files. And after putting in all the effort, there's an extremely strong chance that those callouts are the only ones that are different. I think... 
Yeah, I'm gonna throw in the towel. As much as I would love to be 100% thorough and notate every difference possible, sometimes it's just not viable. And at the end of the day, I probably don't need to be spending countless hours picking apart this game to find out every single possible difference. I can at least say pretty confidently that I found almost every difference, and now that information is out there. But for now, I'm gonna pick my battles and know when to move on. Oh, oh, that's rule number four right there. Yes, brought it home. With that though, we'll shelf this prototype. If I did this a few years ago, I'd probably throw up all this information on the cutting room floor or hidden palace, but I just don't have the time for stuff like that anymore. People will eat that kind of information up though, me included. You know what? Actually, if you do end up putting together a prototype page, send it to me. DM it to my Twitter at RadQC. I don't always respond to every single DM, but I do try my best to read all of them. And trust me, nothing would make me happier than to know I inspired someone to pick up from where I left off. But I'll end my tangent there for now. As always, I hope you keep an eye out for more tech rules.